Welcome back. This is the Intel on ENCA, and we're having a critical conversation about the state of infrastructure investment. You will have heard uh, in the last few years we've been talking about, you know, investment in the economy, but specifically also on issues of the uh, infrastructure investment supporting our growth as we try to grow our way out of this, uh, the doldrums that our economy has been in over the last few years. So we've brought in really some of the people who are at the forefront of it all and we continue our conversation with Dr. Josienzu, Ramohopa, Trudy Makaya as well as Isaiah Mshang. Uh, Trudy, let me bring it back to you. Just before the break, the nice thing about all of this is that I'm a layman in all of this, in this whole conversation. And I, I believe that some of the questions that I'll be asking are questions that some South Africans will be asking themselves, sitting at home, who are, you know, ordinary lay people uh, I, 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 trying to participate in this conversation. Trudy, it sounded to me as a layman, like Isaiah Mshang, I was pointing out to perhaps some work that still needs to be done, a bit more work that needs to be done in ensuring that our talk of infrastructure-led growth out of the problems we have in the economy is matched by, you know, moving away from a consumption-led uh, kind of doing things. Your sense from, you know, the, 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 uh, your, as, as the advisor to the president in as far as the economy is concerned, what, what do you make of that kind of thinking and, and, and sentiment shared by Isaiah? All right, so I heard um, two things from, from Isaiah. I heard questions around um, some of the reforms um, that still need to happen, perhaps. Uh, and then secondly, about the national debate, um, which I think is, is something we, we should um, head towards in, in this conversation. I think he, he was being a bit muted in, in what the national debate is about, but, but we'll get to that. I think one of the things he said was around SOCs and, and, and state-owned uh, enterprises um, and this idea that they are still um, disinvesting. I mean, I think you'll see that for some of them, um, or, or rather there's a cycle um, that SOEs are going through. Um, first, uh, for, for many of the key ones, given all that they've been through over the past few years, it begins with arresting the rot. Um, and I think, you know, there have been studies, reviews, uh, reports, you know, from SARS to ESCOM, uh, where you're seeing that a lot of the work in terms of understanding what went wrong, holding people to accountable, um, is underway. Then you see the rebuilding um, of the institution and um, the restructuring um, of, of those um, um, SOCs, and you see it with new leadership, new strategies with ESCOM, uh, Transnet, um, and, and various others. And then, of course, becomes the question um, of drawing in private sector resources um, towards supporting those institutions. You see it, for instance, with the process underway at SAA. And I think the principle to understand here is that there's got to be appropriate roles um, as we do this, even as we uh, work towards uh, increasing private sector participation in areas like rail. Um, there's got to be uh, a sense uh, between uh, what is feasible and what is appropriate in terms of um, the public sector always being in the driving seat and directing um, those SOCs. So I think a lot of the entities are going through that cycle of, you know, consolidating and then looking forward and drawing in uh, investment. I think the state continues to invest uh, in, in those um, SOCs in terms of, for instance, supporting those um, who are in extreme distress, but we want to go to a point where they're able to sustain their own operations. So I think the SOC agenda is on track. Um, there's regular interactions with the SOC Advisory Council um, just to sharpen those strategies and ensure that we have common principles across the board and that we work to ensure that what happened with SOEs over the past years uh, does never happens again. Now, on the question of the national debate being consumption-driven, um, you know, if we step back and think about what the pandemic has done uh, in terms of devastating people's livelihoods and how government responded appropriately by supporting those livelihoods. For instance, for the first time in our country, having a social grant that is directed towards unemployed adults, um, the, 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 social, the, the COVID-19 special grant um, that was set at 350 rand and renewed um, uh, uh, various times. Is that consumption? On one level, yes, it is consumption, 
But if we're going to have a strong economic recovery, um, and if we're going to act appropriately um, towards citizens who are under pressure in an unprecedented global crisis, I think the government expending money and supporting people's livelihoods was absolutely the correct thing to do. I think it would have been inappropriate uh, to try and deal with the pandemic, to ask for people to make sacrifices and not to expend resources. And it wasn't just the SRD grant, but support through the UIF, support through public employment, et cetera. Um, so it, it might look like consumption, but I think it's an investment in our society. And it was also um, a way to set a foundation for a strong uh, economic recovery, which, you know, has been, you know, we're starting to see some of those green shoots uh, of an economic recovery. Now, the question then becomes, we still have, um, as has been mentioned earlier, 12, close to 12 million people who are in unemployment. And so that's the next phase of the question. What do you do um, about those 12 million people? And once again, I think there's an appreciation that economic growth is what is going to deliver jobs um, at that scale. You know, the ratio of public to private sector employment always means that it has to be the private sector investing and growing that will absorb the majority of those unemployed people. But we also know in terms of recent economic history that you know, for the private sector to create jobs, it won't be at that scale immediately. The public sector government has to do something, as it did uh, under the pandemic, to create opportunities uh, for employment. And so the question has been, and the debate, I guess, has been, is it about extending grants indefinitely? Uh, is it about having a universal basic income grant? And there are no, you know, um, the, the debate is still open. But I think from, from what we've seen and from what the president has said, from what the finance minister has also said, and many others uh, in the national executive, the focus um, has to be on creating employment. So however the state intervenes, we have to ensure that people retain um, some sense of productivity and that whatever government spends, it be it in a public works program, is done in such a way that whatever people are doing positions them to be in the labor market. So for instance, under the COVID-19 um, scheme, there were those opportunities, 700,000 or so, uh, but a big bulk of that was in the education sector, where we had young people mostly going into schools and acting as curriculum assistants and also as infrastructure maintenance assistants um, uh, to just characterize the two types of roles broadly. Now, those are kinds of opportunities that help the community, help that school ensure that the curriculum is delivered, especially under difficult pandemic conditions, ensure that infrastructure is maintained, and also gives that person skills, real skills in terms of being able to um, hold the attention of a class, um, uh, conduct administration, conduct maintenance. And I think going forward, the stress of dealing, the, the focus, the emphasis of dealing with those 12 million people will be around creating those kinds of um, opportunities. Now, in the way we account, you know, that might look like um, it's consumption-led, but when you think about the skills um, that are being imparted, when you think about the fact that you're helping adults remain productive, I think there's, there's uh, a lot to be said that this has to be done, that it won't be cheap, uh, but at the same time, the focus can't be um, just on more and more and more unconditional, open-ended um, grants. There's got to be a focus on how do you spend money to support the unemployed in a way that actually makes them employ employable. So I think that's where Isaiah was in terms of um, the national debate about how to move forward. Uh, but none of that undermines the important infrastructure drive that's underway, the important structural reform that's underway, and the understanding that jobs are going to have to come from economic growth. But we know that even when we're growing, we often don't create the right scale of jobs to deal with the crisis that we're dealing with, a crisis which has been worsened uh, by a pandemic. So I would see that expenditure as being supportive um, to growth in the long term and not uh, being uh, consumption. Of course, I say this emphasizing that we think that whatever emerges from this national debate is going to be focused more on supporting productivity and supporting work uh, as opposed to being um, uh, more around just more social um, grants. 
And, and I suppose there's still a lot of questions, Tula, around the sort of you know, financial backing for such a grant. There's a debate there, and yeah. at what point do you introduce it? But I want to I wanna extend this to what uh, Trudy said about the focus being jobs now and bring in Dr. Ramahopa once more again. Doc, when we spoke last week at the symposium, I mean, one of the things that came up there was the fact that, I mean, you've told me that securing the funding, securing the money for this is one thing. And that doesn't seem to be too much of a task when you compare it to the actual ability to get some of these infrastructure projects on the ground working. And I'm talking about municipalities, the competency levels there. I'm talking about local government, because what you essentially do is secure the money, secure the project, and then hand it over to these governments. Now, what happens from that point is critical, because that speaks to the, the speed and the efficacy at which uh, these projects happen. What's been your experience there, and, and seemingly, is it slow at that point, on the local government municipality level? We see what is it that we are doing to ensure that we accelerate the delivery of this project. So as you might know that uh, Trudy and uh, some of my colleagues in the presidency and uh, national treasury, she's championing uh, what we call Operation Golindela, essentially is to introduce the necessary reforms, at least in the infrastructure space, to help to advance these uh, projects to, towards implementation. One of those has to do with what, what we call the records of uh, decisions before you can build a school, you can set up a uh, industry. There's a legislative requirement that you have to obtain what you call uh, an environmental uh, impact uh, assessment, and that gets to be obtained from the provincial government. And the experiences across the country, with the exception of Houting, is that uh, it takes uh, on about, about 15 months for people to obtain those uh, records. Of now we know that the. Um, the experience of Houten is different because they've uh, introduced um, additional capacity and expertise to ensure that the, the approvals uh, of, um, of records of decision takes uh, not more than 80 days. So that's how you are going to accelerate it. And we're looking to use the Houten template uh, to, to be exported to other provinces. And then the second one has to do with uh, what we call water use licenses. So depending on the, the kind of infrastructure and the uses uh, that uh, you you, you want to um, exercise uh, as part of your investment, there is a legislative requirement that you need to obtain a water use license. And this is uh, obtained from the National Department of Water and Sanitation. Again, it can take you up to uh, 18 months for you to obtain that. So what we are doing now is to truncate that process without undermining the rigor and transparency that is required to obtain a water use license. And we are bringing it down to uh, to under 60 days so these are some of the kind of uh, institutional reforms or arrangements that are required to make uh, the state uh, if you like a bit more efficient so that we are able to facilitate the uh, private sector participation and then there's a third leg that has to do with the uh, zoning so before industry can put up a factory um, the, the the rights must be in place and for those rights to be in place the municipality sits with the responsibility of zoning that space and you find that as uh, you have mentioned correctly there that we have uh, attracted this money there's an intention of private sector definitive that we want to invest in this space but but you find that the zoning is not in place, although um, that um, uh, the rights are uh, in keeping or the application is in keeping with the, the special development plans of those municipalities. So what is it that we are doing? We are working with many of these uh, municipalities to ensure that there's additional capacity that we help them from a planning uh, point of view to accelerate the zoning um, um, uh, applications. Of course, they still need the, the, the requirement for public participation, but we have seen that in uh, the more poor rural and far-flung municipalities, there is no such capacity that allows them to take opportunity of uh, the investment appetite into their spaces. So we're working with those municipalities to ensure that we're able to accelerate that. We have been able to attract the, the attention of the private sector. They've made resources available to us. So we're working with some of the most experienced uh, um, um, uh, um, uh, practitioners in that space. And some of them are an embedded in these municipalities so that we're able to access, uh, accelerate that deliver. And then the second point I want to 
to make um, outside just the reforms is the extent to which we are able to expand the network industries in the you are more poorer um, and less or if you like less affluent rural uh, provinces so we have done a longitudinal study of um, the type of investment or if you like the geographic distribution of investment across the, the the sovereign map of the country and you found that this concentration of investments in your more metro areas in your provinces of Gauteng, KwaZulu Natal, KwaZulu Natal in particular, Etequini, the Western Cape in particular, Cape Town and you find that the, the six other provinces are excluded from the the kind of investment that have taken place over the 27 years. So we needed to ask the question why is it that the, the distribution of uh, investment is not equitably um, distributed uh, across the, the geography of the country. And we have found that um, the transversal um, uh, issue there is that there's an absence of uh, um, a quality network uh, infrastructure. What do we mean by network infrastructure? The absence of uh, good quality water that is uh, required at the right quantities and available at the time that is needed. The second one is that the, the, the road network is not efficient, so a lot of those roads are not surface. It undermines the ability of industry to access market, to draw your, your inputs, uh, if you like, raw materials to, to those sites uh, because uh, the, the extent of, uh, of the roads, if you like, uh, the quality of the road is of such a nature that uh, it has uh, an impact on, uh, on the quality of, uh, or rather the cost of, uh, of uh, delivering the, the, producing the final product. And then the third one is uh, the absence of uh, a reliable uh, energy supply. We know that is a nationwide uh, problem, but it's particularly pronounced in those uh, areas. Some of these spaces are not on the grid, so there's a need for you to expand, expand the, if you like, the energy access, throw it into those spaces. And the fourth one, of course, COVID has illustrated uh, the need for us to ensure that the provision of uh, affordable, uh, reliable, and fast uh, internet access uh, uh, should be a, a, a basic uh, municipal, uh, municipal service. And if you right. go to these areas, you find right. that there's an absence of those. So now, out of this uh, symposium, and working with the um, National Treasury, we are beginning to solution how we can be able to finance that infrastructure in those spaces. Because once those uh, network infrastructure is in place, the likelihood of attracting private sector into those spaces increases and increases exponentially. Right. And you are going to ensure that, uh, right. of course, with the additional right. incentives, you should be able to bring opportunities uh, to those people in those far-flying areas. Dr. Ramakhopa, let, uh, Ramakhopa, let's pause it there for a moment. We come back with concluding thoughts here uh, on the panel discussion. This is the Intel on ENCA.